Hey ladies, welcome this evening. I am so excited and energized to introduce our speaker for this evening, Kelly Commander. She is the president and CEO of K2 Creative and PR. She works with dozens of small businesses and nonprofit organizations to expand their reach and build recognition with sensible strategic public relations, marketing and branding services. Kelly's lifelong struggle with, is with imposter syndrome, and that led her to creating the anthology 21, which is 21 female entrepreneurs share, who share their stories of resilience during a global crisis and writing the chapter, she actually wrote the chapter entitled From Imposter to Inspiration. Well-respected as a speaker, publicist, and author, she has been seen and heard on outlets across the nation and globally. As a speaker, she helps professionals conquer their fears and insecurities when struggling with imposter syndrome, utilizing her WTFs, can't wait to hear what those are, relatable stories and common sense strategies, her audiences have walked away feeling inspired. Kelly is a lover of love, writing and food, and a hater of hate, chaos, and stemless wine glasses. Um, so please join me in welcoming Kelly Commander. Marilee, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. I really appreciate it. Before we get started, I have a couple of questions. Feel free to raise your hand or just nod. Let me know your feelings on this. How many of you have ever felt that your success was due to outside luck or forces that were beyond what you have done? to experience success. Yeah. And we got some thumbs up, we got some hands, okay. How many of you were overly sensitive to even the most constructive criticism? I know I can be sometimes, yeah. How many of you downplay your expertise even when you know that you are more skilled than the other people in your group? And how many of you panic and go into complete crazy mode when you think that somebody might discover you as a fraud or a phony. Yeah, that is me for sure. So you, my friends, may be suffering from imposter syndrome. I'm gonna start my slides now. Give me one second here. Let's see, there we go. All right. So as Marilee introduced me, I am Kelly Commander, and thank you everyone so much for being here this evening. Um, and as I said, if you can identify with any of the above, any of the things that I mentioned, chances are you probably have imposter syndrome. So did you know that about 82% of people have reported having imposter syndrome? It is most prevalent in women, but it's very prevalent in women of color and celebrities and very successful people, including Warren Buffett, Mark Cuban and Paul McCartney have all reported to feeling like imposters, even when they are doing like big deals. They have reported like, what am I doing here? How am I doing this? Tom Hanks, Maya Angelou, they have all had issues with imposter syndrome. So this is how we're gonna spend our time this evening. We are gonna do the weird, what is imposter syndrome? We're gonna talk about early experiences that you may have had that led to your imposter syndrome. We're going to identify which imposter personalities you most resonate with. We're going to talk about those WTF tips that Marilee mentioned, and it is not what you think. Get your minds out of the gutter. And then we're also going to determine your three realities. So you should all have your workbook with you. Um, feel free to follow along virtually, or if you printed it out, feel free to follow along. Take notes. There's some areas where I'm going to ask you to participate and take notes. So hopefully that workbook is going to be something you're going to keep with you and keep by your side for a long time. So tonight you will leave, hopefully feeling like an inspiration. You're gonna have knowledge and support. You're gonna have tips and suggestions. And hopefully like me, you're gonna go from feeling like an imposter to feeling truly like an inspiration. So my story, who is Kelly Commander and why am I standing in front of you tonight talking about imposter syndrome? <coughs> Excuse me. So my whole life from kindergarten through my senior year of school, I was in the gifted program. I got a lot of A's, gold stars, popular, lots of friends, prom queen my senior year, the whole nine yards. But there was always something in my head that told me that I wasn't good enough, no matter how much success I ever saw. So I started off in the people business. Anywhere I ever worked, I always dealt with people and the public. And funny thing is my first, one of my first paying jobs was a bingo girl 
at the local fire department, which is how I met my husband, believe it or not, 30 some years later. That's a whole other story for a whole other night. But I always worked in the people business, whether it was in food service, whether it was in retail, marketing, publishing, always working with people. And I spent 11 years of my career working at the Pittsburgh Business Times. And that is truly where I learned the value of having a really strong supportive network, of knowing how to network, going out to events, and just really learning the basics of how to be in the business world. But I have a secret. I do not have a college degree, which I know has a lot to do with my imposter syndrome. I went to two years of community college, and in one semester, I remember taking a pharmaceutical math, a biology, a creative writing, and an English course all at the same time. So obviously that was a lot of confusion for me of not knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then business times came along in 2004 when my kids were in elementary school. And that's whenever I realized that me not having that college degree was really working against me, but it was me working against me. I got multiple pr promotions and raises while I was there. And every single time that happened, I thought, what are they doing? They know I don't have this degree. Why are they rewarding me? Why are they advancing me? And that's why I'm sharing this with you today, because I truly feel that I can help people with their imposter syndrome to give you lessons and a platform to help yourself begin to get over the imposter syndrome. So let's get started. All right. So before tonight, have any of you ever heard of imposter syndrome? Yeah. Has anyone ever struggled with it? Past? or present. And if you have, and if you have a story to share, or if you want to talk a little bit about it, please feel free to just speak up and, you know, share your story of, of what made you feel like an imposter or what situation made you feel like a fraud. Does anybody want to share? You don't have to, but if anybody wants to share, please feel free. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, go ahead, Kayla. Do you have something to say? Go ahead. I was going to say, I am a woman in science. And so I am in a, what I would say is a male dominated field. And so feeling imposter syndrome and is a, is a common feeling. Yes, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. That's why they have a special day for you guys, right? You have a whole women in science. that was just like a few weeks ago, which I always make sure I post on social media because I'm so proud of her. Um, <laughs> so let's talk first about what imposter syndrome is not, okay? It is not a women only thing. It is not just women who suffer from imposter syndrome. Although the term was coined back in the seventies, we're gonna to get to that, about high achieving successful women is where the term actually came from. It is not a lack of confidence. I can tell you guys right now, I'm a confident person. Just because I have confidence and sometimes I radiate that confidence, it does not mean that I don't have imposter syndrome. And it definitely isn't your fault. Am I right? I mean. You feel like it is your fault, but it is definitely not your fault. So as I said, it is mostly women, although men do struggle, successful and high achieving individuals often suffer from imposter syndrome. The, the term was coined back in the 70s by two psychologists and the roundabout very brief definition, and I'm gonna read it right from the screen so I don't get it wrong. It's an internal experience of believing that you are not as competent as others perceive you to be. So think about that. You are not as competent as what others think you are. Okay, so what is imposter syndrome? In three simple words, it is doubt, fear, and insecurity. It is loosely defined as just not ever feeling secure in your abilities. It's doubting yourself. It is questioning whether or not you deserve that raise or questioning whether or not you deserve that promotion questioning whether you deserve the title that you have at your job. So despite external evidence of success, internally, you're constantly fighting with yourself that you don't deserve what you have in your career and sometimes even in your personal life. So one thing that's really important to remember is that imposter syndrome can affect anyone. It does not matter what your job is, what your education level is, what your social status is. Imposter syndrome is something that affects people from all walks of life. 
So in your workbook, you're gonna find that there is a page about early experiences. And I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly because I am not a psychologist or a therapist or even a coach, but I wanna just go over these very briefly and see if anyone can resonate with any of these. So one of the three early experiences is the smart one. So you were the smart one in your family. You were the person who got the best grades or who had the most success in school. So anytime you have to work hard at something, that's proof that you're an imposter. So is anybody in this group the smart one in their family? Yeah, I see Corey raising her hand. That's how I was too. I was always expected, <laughs> Kayla, Mayor, uh, Gabby, I was always expected to do well, to get good grades, to go to a four-year college or more and have this fancy degree. And it just was not in the cards for me. So the other early experience, one of the other early experiences is the hard worker. That is the person who had to work really hard for success. So when something does come easy to them, they think that it's not real. Yep, that's Renee, the hard worker. Okay, so if something comes easy, it doesn't make any sense. Naomi too, as well, yes. Because you always had to work hard for things, you're an imposter and you're not really successful if it came easy to you. And the last one is, to me, it's a sad one. It's the unsupported. And that is an individual who did not feel support from an adult figure whether it's parents, older siblings, teachers, educators, professors, you never felt that support for your education. So it's really hard for you to celebrate when you do well, whether it's academically, professionally, you feel like an imposter or a fraud because you were never celebrated for what you did. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are raising their hands for that one too. So, I mean, if anybody wants to share, feel free to unmute. Go ahead, Mayor. Yeah, Cal, I was actually not raising my hand for any one of those ones because mine actually <laughs> i don't think i fell into any one of those in fact it was the opposite of the hard worker um and what i mean by that is i was definitely the the girl in school in high school and college who liked to socialize um so i was the b's and c's get degrees not the a's um and where my brother was the 4.0 person and i you know, I, when I got my first management job, I was working at Disney World. Like I was a manager at Disney World, like working as a retail manager. And I can't tell you like how much I felt like an imposter because I felt like I actually didn't work hard enough to get there. So I was just curious, like, I'm sure you see some outliers or if that maybe, maybe that falls under one of these ones that I'm not even like sure of, but it was just, it was just interesting when I was reading this. I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm the opposite of the smart one and the hard worker, even though I know I'm smart. Right. Yeah. So I'm wondering, there might be like a fourth category. It's the Marilee Smith category. <laughs> but no, I totally get what you're saying, because I went through a phase like that when I was in high school as well, that being popular and, you know, having a lot of friends was more important to me than learning, studying, advancing. So it sounds like you had kind of the smart one and like the popular one or the outgoing one as maybe like a fit between them to see which one really fit with you. That's yeah. interesting. I'm going to have to do a little bit of research on that because I'm sure you're not the only person that feels that you have a separate category, you know? And even though, I mean, I think also, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I do still fall into the hard worker because there's a reason why I got where I did. It just was, I think, it, I think it was my limiting belief that you had to have straight A's, right? To be able to get to, you know, something like that, I guess. So, right. And that know. could have been the smart one for you because if you didn't get the straight A's, then you felt that you weren't successful. So, Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, so there are, in addition to those three early experiences, there are also five imposter identities. Okay. We're going to go through these ones. I'm going to go through kind of quickly, um, but there's also a page in your workbook for these as well. And out of all five of these, there is something with every single one of them that I identify with. So chances are you're going to see yourself in more than one of these descriptions. Okay. And that's okay too. So take some notes, jot some feelings down, some thoughts. And then at the end, once I go through all five of them, we're going to discuss a little bit and see if anybody wants to share any of these identities that they resonated with. Okay. So the perfectionist. This is definitely me to a certain extent. Your work must be 100% all of the time. You fixate on mistakes and flaws and you really have a lot of high anxiety around your work. And I'll give you an example about how 
my work has to be 100% perfect. And this isn't even a work situation. I make a list. I'm a list maker. I make a list in the morning of what I have to do for the day and in the evening for what I have to do for the following day. I've actually caught myself rewriting my list because it was sloppy or because I made a mistake. You know, that's the perfectionism. And that can give you imposter syndrome because when you do make a mistake or a flaw, you think that the whole world is going to end, that you are not good enough, that you are not able to be successful because you made a mistake or a flaw. And that does give you a lot of anxiety. I don't know about anybody else, but I am an anxious person. I have had anxiety for a very long time. Oh, hold on. We're going crazy there. There we go. Um, and being a perfectionist actually causes anxiety. It makes you more anxious than what you actually need to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the superhero. <clears throat> Excuse me. Superhero, I can also resonate with because I have stayed late at work to work harder and longer and faster than somebody else. And as a business owner now, I feel the superhero thing because I get stressed sometimes when I'm not working. I don't know how many of you as business owners have sat back and thought, I shouldn't be watching television tonight. I should be writing a proposal. I should be creating my social media posts for the next week. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. You constantly feel that you have to be the Superman or the Wonder Woman, that you constantly have to do better than someone else. And you feel inadequate and you push yourself way too hard and much more hard than what is required of you. So that is the superhero. And I'm sure many people can also resonate with that. The natural genius, back to some of those early experiences again, the natural genius is someone who excels without a lot of effort. They're the straight A's, the gold stars. They are someone who sets very high goals for themselves. I see who raised their hand, Kayla. Uh-huh, the natural genius, mirror your hands up. I see that, yes. Um, you're never satisfied with your level of learning because if you don't know everything, you don't know anything. Am I right? Do you guys feel that way too, that you have to know everything before you start a project or before you jump in and volunteer for an organization, something, you have to know it. Excuse me, you have to know it all. So that's the natural genius. And I'm sure a lot of you feel that way as well. Then there's the soloist. Let's think about um, Jennifer Lopez or Beyonce or Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake. They are the soloist, right? They are the person who's on stage, the leading act at the concert, but they have a backup team. They have their equipment managers. They have the drummers and the guitarists and the backup dancers. Soloists, they don't want any of that. They have to do everything on their own. Partnering with someone means that you can't take full credit for the project because you had help from someone else and seeking that help means that you're weak. So anybody who has an issue working in a group or working with a partner definitely resonates with a soloist, okay? So then the final one is the expert. And the expert judges themselves on how much they know and what they know. So you're never satisfied with the amount of knowledge that you have. And unless you know all of it, you might as well know none of it. So these people, I believe, from what I have done in research, tend to not take on projects or not volunteer for things if they don't know all of it. So you're not willing to learn new things and experiment or maybe have some help from outside sources. I think the soloist kind of combines with this expert. You're not going to be willing to do something unless you 100% know all of it. And that's hard too, because nobody wants to try something and not know what they're doing, but then how do you learn? How do you learn if you don't try something new? So those are the five personality types. And if anyone has a story, you know, just hop on. Cause I can't really see everyone just because of me sharing my screen, you know, just unmute and just talk to me a little bit. Talk to all of us. If you feel comfortable sharing about what you resonated with the most and why. Hey, Kelly, it's Naomi. Hi. Um, hey, I think I resonated mostly with the expert, but um, I don't really see it as like, for me, it's not being willing to jump into to things without knowing everything, but it's then 
feeling like when I'm doing something or I'm relaying information or if I'm helping with something, just not really understanding the full scope of it. And then feeling negative thoughts about myself because I don't know every single detail. No, that totally makes sense. <clears throat> that, that is definitely a symptom of imposter syndrome because, and especially with you, Naomi, just knowing you as well as I do, you've been in your industry for a very long time and you have so much experience. I would venture that you probably know about 90% of everything there is to know in banking. <laughs> so whenever... <laughs> So when it comes down to maybe that 10% that you don't know, that becomes a problem for you because you're also a perfectionist, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And I think that that all, you know, it combines. I'm sure there's other things that I mentioned that you definitely see in yourself, but being the expert, you know, and I think with you being a manager, you're probably also a lot of the soloist as well. Am I right? Because yes, you know, yes. I mean, your team is expected to do things and you help your team with things. But I also think that because you are the person in charge, that it makes you feel like you're kind of out on a, an ocean by yourself. Yeah, I think that they definitely have goals and I, I want to help them get there. But at the same time, I'm ready to, to take on what they're not willing to do or can't do to make up whatever gap we have. Right, which is also superhero. <laughs> Mark me down for everything. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. That was very brave. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? Don't You don't have to. You're not forced. But if you feel comfortable, come on and talk about it. I'll share. Thanks, Cor. Sure. Um, so I felt mostly uh, the perfectionist and the expert, though I have done a lot of work on taming this. Um, for me, I also feel like... Uh, it's something that has been fed into by the people around me. So even as a child, it was like, if I, um, the kids in my class would say, oh, what'd you get on the test? And if I scored one point less than them, they'd run off going, oh, I got better than Corey. And, you know, clear through school, clear through um, even work. Um, I used to work as a writer editor for the government. I was at the FBI and then the Department of Energy. And I spent 10 years there and it was like any single like little mistake, um, they would come back on me. I didn't get compliments, but I definitely got dinged for every little like, well, you screwed this up, you missed this. So I felt like that really fed into the perfectionist thing. Like, oh my God, I'm such a failure. You know, I, I can't even do this. This is so easy. Why can't I, um, you know, catch every single little mistake? So it was this weird thing where I was hunting for mistakes and <laughs> trying to fix them and I still wasn't catching them all. And that made me feel flawed myself. So yeah, it was a real vicious circle. I was going to say that's, that's brutal. That's yeah. brutal to be doing the very best that you can and then never being complimented for good work. I mean, none of us want to be patted on the back 24 seven, right? Nobody wants to do something and get attention and rewards and accolades every single time they do something right, right. They throw you a bone, right? Yeah. I mean, at least make you feel a little bit appreciated. And, you know, I learned something from a manager a very long time ago, and I don't know the exact wording of it, but it was something to the effect of that you, you praise in public and you reprimand in private. Yes. So if something comes up where you have made a mistake, an error, a flaw, whatever, pull them aside, pull you aside, Corey, and say, hey, you know what? We found a bunch of missed periods or commas in your work. But then whenever you do something good, praise people in public. So that, that totally makes sense to me. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Sure. You guys are all so brave. All right, so we're talking about the bad stuff, right? The stuff that makes us feel like crap, basically. The stuff that makes us feel less than other people. So let's talk about how to get out of this, okay? Let's talk about my WTF recovery tips. And no, it's not what the huh, it's not where's the food, even though anyone who knows me knows I'm always looking for the food. Um, it is wake up, terminate, and find courage and opportunities. So what does wake up mean? Wake up literally means what I'm telling you to do. Wake up. <laughs> find your aha moment. I found my aha moment beginning in December of 2019 
And that aha moment came full circle by June of 2020. Now we all know what happened between that time period and the world, right? March of 2020 was when the pandemic hit, okay? But December of 19, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. I was overweight, I was exhausted, I was moody. You can ask my family, hopefully none of them will speak up on this call. I was irritable, my skin was dry, I was itchy, I would scratch till I bled. Something was wrong, okay? Find out late December of 19, I have type two diabetes. All right, I gotta change my life, right? I am not going to have to sneak into a public bathroom if I'm out at 7 p.m. to give myself a shot of insulin. I'm just not going to live that way. My father was a type two diabetic. Um, it contributed to his um, death at the age of 58 years old. At the time I was 48, 47, 48. And I, I just wasn't gonna let it happen. So in that whole process of me processing that I had something physically health-wise wrong, I realized there was a lot of wrong stuff. I was in a career in banking that I was really unhappy with. I just wasn't doing what I thought I should be doing. Took another position in digital marketing, March rolls around, pandemic hits, the world shuts down for two weeks. Am I right? Two weeks, I get laid off. Lots of time to think, okay? Lots of time to walk. Lots of time to get out in fresh air, to start eating better, the exercise, start to drop weight start to feel better about myself. Boom, I'm off the insulin, but I'm still not happy because I know I have to go back to work someday. I have to go back to work for someone else. Six weeks after the pandemic hits, I get called back. I ask if I can sleep on it, call them back the next day. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not coming back. From that moment, I determined it was time to wake up and not only change my physical self, but change my emotional, my mental self. And that's whenever I started my own business. By June of 2020 is when I started K2 Creative PR. So no matter what your issues are, no matter what your wake-up call and your aha moment is, write it down. Jot it down. And you know what? Maybe you haven't had it yet. And that's okay, too. You might not have had that major thing that's happened in your life to make you feel that you needed to make a change. <laughs> Excuse me. So the next tip for the T is terminate. And terminate is another word for what? Stop. Did you, go ahead, Corey, do you want to say something? I'm sorry. No, stop. Okay. So it's, it's stop. Okay. First of all, stop comparing yourself to other people. Stop reading the humble brags on Facebook. Stop looking at all the positivity on social media that you know is crap. How many people post whenever they wake up in the morning with smeared makeup, messy hair, and their kids are screaming and their house is a mess. It's rare, right? Stop that social media stuff and comparing yourself to other people, okay? Speaking of people, stop surrounding yourself with the wrong people. I gave a, a presentation a few months ago with a organization that I'm involved with called the Brave Women Project. And it was about finding your village and creating your village. Your friends change all the time. I had friends when my kids were in elementary school that I don't even see or talk to anymore because at the time it was convenient. Our kids went to school together. We volunteered together. You know, we hung out together. We were friends. Your friends are always going to change. When you feel that you're being brought down or unsupported by someone, it is time to terminate that friendship. It's hard. Trust me, it is really difficult. But if you don't have cheerleaders, if you don't have a support system, if you don't have a village of people to support you, to bounce ideas off of, you're with the wrong people. And I know that Corey and Marilee can definitely, definitely understand this because the three of us have a group text going where we are bouncing ideas off of each other and talking about things. Renee and I do this all the time. We've been doing this since 2004, 2005 when I met her. You know, Naomi and I, we did this when we worked together where, you know, we would meet for lunch and get together and support each other and talk to each other about things. Gabby, now she's on my team. So we are always sending messages and doing things of support. Kayla, all the time, even though I don't truly understand what she does, I still try to support her and be there for her as her mom, right? So you have to terminate those friendships and those relationships that bring you down and do not bring you joy and positivity. You just you truly have to. And the other part of terminate is the negative self-talk. 
there's some um, terms in your workbook where I went in and I just did a little bit of switcheroo. Instead of saying things like, I don't deserve this, say, I worked hard for this and I do deserve it. Negative self-talk is so bad. And I never understood all that woo-woo stuff is what I call it until I put together the 21 book and I met a lot of different women who showed me what it meant to have mantras, to say certain things before I go to bed at night or when I wake up in the morning. So try to be positive, try to terminate the negativity and the negative self-talk because you are your biggest fan. And guess what? You spend the most time with yourself. Think about it. So if you're being negative and you're being anti, oh, Renee, it's okay to let go of family members. And that's true. I'm just picking up the chat right now. It is true. It's not just friends. Sometimes it's family. You have to terminate those relationships that are bringing you down. You know, I once had someone who was a very, very good friend say to me, I am jealous of your success. And that was the red flag. That was the red flag that told me like something's not right. You know, maybe instead of being happy for me and supporting me, you know, maybe they are jealous. And for somebody to have the guts to admit that, I think is a huge deal. I think that takes a lot of bravery, but yet at the same time, it's something that I can't make time for. Move to the back of the theater. They don't get a front row seat. Thank you, Marilee. That is definitely true. If people are going to be watching you from the front row, they need to be the people who are supporting you and caring about you and wanting to see you be successful. So thank you. That means a lot. There's my girl. Hi, London. All right. So the final one of my recovery tips is find courage and opportunity. No one can teach you how to find courage. This is something I think that you have to do on your own. But through the courage, you're able to find opportunity. And I'll tell you what, I had a really hard time. And I still have a hard time telling people that the pandemic was something that benefited me professionally. We all know that people have lost jobs, businesses. They've lost their life over these last two years almost through the pandemic. But because of that, because I was home and I was able to really get my thoughts together and get myself together personally, it also allowed me the opportunity to dig down deep and find the courage to start my own business. You know, it's not that easy. And I would have truly, I, I would say 90% never done this if it weren't for the pandemic and that opportunity that it afforded me to be home and to have that chance to really determine what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I, the funny thing is, is that in the beginning of 2020 in January, I was having lunch with my friend Molly, who um, I worked with the Community Liver Alliance. And I remember telling her we were at the Hard Rock Cafe down in Station Square. And I was telling her about my diagnosis and all this other stuff. And I remember saying to her, 2020 is the year of Kelly. This is my year. Now, little did I know what was going to happen in that year. But when I look back at saying that, it truthfully was my year. I changed my health. I changed my career. And I was able to partner with 20 other women and start the process of putting together that 21 book that came out in April of 2021. So if anybody wants to share anything that they feel they resonate with, with these WTF tips, whether it's your wake up and your, your aha moment, things that maybe you'll terminate after we get off of this call today, or anything that has to do with finding courage and opportunity, I would love if you felt comfortable enough to share with us. That is fine. I don't want to force anybody to come out of their comfort zone. So it's all good. But I hope I'll that you have some. Thing. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, you know that, um, you know, I've been in at my job for a long time, like we talked about. And I think anytime that you've been somewhere a good length of time, you have like really good time periods where you're strong and things are going your way. And then you have dips, like, you know, peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. And I was recently in uh, more of a valley. And, you know, trying to figure out how to get out of it. And I really found that like getting rid of people that were uh, not getting rid of, but um, not spending my time with people that um, contributed to that negative feel was really important. Um, you know, I have a mantra that sits uh, next to me um, on a little note card 
and it's just like a little bible verse and it tells me that like god has a plan for me basically and it's a you know it's not to create calamity but to foster hope and you know and it's just something that i think that when i look at that during the day if i'm having like a rough day um i look at it and i think okay so this is just like a little blip and for the most part things are going to be good so I, I think that's very true like eliminating people that are and negatively affecting and like creating and fostering relationships that help you feel good and feel strong um and then really like focusing on your mental mental health is good and it's really hard, right? Especially like, you know, yeah. when I popped on and said that it's okay to eliminate family relationships or maybe not even eliminate, maybe steer clear or have less interaction. And that yeah, is take it from hard. Too. Yeah. That's hard. But when you think about the benefits of maybe pushing someone aside and maybe taking time for yourself, I think it outweighs the negativity. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. I think you raised your hand. I was just going to build off of what Naomi said, you know, building off of the tea, you know, whenever you do build that high vibe tribe, that village, you know, when you move to the F, find courage and opportunity, that's where that really starts to open up for you. Um, you know, sometimes that's really hard. It's one thing to say to find courage, but if you've been stuck in these, you know, these, these beliefs and these thoughts about yourself for a long time, it takes some rewiring the, of the brain to do that. So some of the things that you've shared already, obviously, definitely, but also finding that high vibe tribe to help support you, to help give you opportunities. I mean, Kelly, you did that for me whenever you invited me to be part of the book, right? That like was a wake up, like, oh, my imposter syndrome, but you also were so supportive and like never questioned you know whether we could do it or not and that meant all the world and the fact that i have you guys to like you said we touch base on with each other all the time on things so i just say that you know terminate these people the high vibe tribe will help give you the, the courage and the opportunity you know and it's funny that you say that because then i think what about people who don't have that i mean let's be honest there are people out there who do not have anyone to turn to and I'm not talking about, you know, husband, wife, because like Rob doesn't really know what I do. He knows what I do, but he's not a support system as far as me being able to like bounce ideas off of him or, you know, whatever. What if someone truly doesn't have that support system? They don't have guy friends or girlfriends or coworkers or, you know, that has to be really difficult. So this is an open invitation that if somebody needs a high vibe tribe, <laughs> here we are right here, right? Renee, did you have something to say? Yes. Um, you know, hi. Hi. I'm not going to show myself. I got caught in the Florida rain today. I come to Florida and it's cloudy and it rains, but that's okay. It's going to be <laughs> sunny tomorrow at Disney. Find the opportunity, um, Renee. Make it good. That's right. You know me. So the terminate thing, you know, I got, I got to the point in my life where I have a sister-in-law that hates me. And I couldn't take it anymore. So I deleted her from Facebook, which caused a major issue with my brother. And he's like, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to fix this? I'm like, your wife can't stand me. I have a therapist now because of my last job and because of her. And I need to fix myself. This isn't between you fixing anything. This is between me and her. Um, and that's it. And I had to have the courage to do it. I wanted to do it so many times, but I couldn't because I wanted to keep that peace. But I've never felt better. And that's just See that? how it is. See and that? And you again, said the courage something, wait, Renee, let me stop you real quick because you said something really important there. You had to fix you. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I've, I've made this claim and it's in the workbook. I'm not a therapist. I am not, you know, I, I'm nobody who can sit and tell you how to fix yourself or, you know, these are all suggestions. But it is true. If you don't love yourself and if you're not courageous and you don't feel strong in what you're doing, how are you going to have relationships with other people? How are you going to interact with peers, colleagues, family members? So I think that you flat out saying that you wanted to work on you first before you worried about that relationship is a huge deal. Mayor, that has a lot to do with some of the energy stuff that you do in your business too, right? Go ahead, Renee. Are you still there? Yeah. And then the find courage and opportunity. I mean, I'm always telling people and as a coach, 
you have to live your best life. And I wasn't doing it because I had a work uh, person harassing me. And I was doing great in my job and my boss didn't want to see me leave, but I had to. I left six months earlier than when I wanted to. I left $35,000 on the table. I didn't want to do that, but I had to. And I'm telling everybody else to do this and I'm not. So talk about feeling like a fraud. You know, I struggled with this because the money meant more to me and now I'm healthier, more, you know, doing great. Everything's coming to me. Um, and I found the opportunities. My phone's ringing. People are calling me. I'm getting jobs. I'm getting coaching clients. I mean, I, that took, and then even Kelly, she's like, what? You know, do it already. You know, because I would always tell her to do it and I'm not doing it. But yeah, so, you know, this 2021 was eye opening for me. It really, really was. So, yes. Yep. And it just and do I it. never thought would ever need a therapist. Got one. Best thing ever. Best mm -hmm. thing ever. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. And that actually is courageous, too. Right. Because you're ask you're asking for help. And that takes courage to say, I can't fix this on my own. I need someone to talk to. And to me, that is probably more important than just about anything else is making sure that you're healed from the inside before you start to try to, you know, whether it's a work thing, whether it's a personal thing, before you get to that level, to be able to have that courage to say, I need help. And then to take the opportunity that's given you, right? That is an opportunity to work with a therapist, to have someone to talk it out to hire a coach, to hire a mentor, somebody along those lines that are able to help you live your best life. Like you said, Renee, and that, that resonates with me 100%. Now, this is really good that we were talking about this because now we're going to move on to your three realities. I want you to think really hard and jot down or just have it in your mind, three realities about yourself that you can turn into mantras, that you can say at night before you go to bed, you can say them in the morning when you wake up. You can even say them whenever you're having a rough day or a good day. You can remind yourself of the positive things about yourself whenever you're having a good day, not just a bad day. So I'll tell you mine while you guys are thinking about yours or jotting them down. And they change all the time. They don't have to stick to be the same exact three realities. My first reality is I am a business owner. I did it. I literally have an EIN number <laughs> and the legal paperwork that says that I own a business. And in that business, I help people every day with their public relations, their marketing, their branding. And guess what? I also have three amazing people on my team that I'm able to give opportunities to. So my business is my first reality. My second reality is I am a published author. And oh, by the way, three-time bestseller on Amazon and top 10 in women in business. My reality with the book is that I had a dream of becoming an author. I created the 21 book. I brought 20 other incredible women along with me to write chapters in this book. And we are all published authors. We actually have a physical book that we wrote. We wrote this book. And to some people, there's a lot of women in the book who were already authors. So it was like, hey, it's just writing another book. But to most of the women, this was their first opportunity as it was mine to be a published author. And my third reality is more personal. It's more of, um, I'm just a caring person and I want to help others. And I know that is why I've seen success in other areas of my life because and even though it sometimes looked at as a bad thing, I put other people before myself. And I know you got to put your own oxygen mask on before you can save anyone else. But an, uh, my major reality on a personal level is that I always want to help other people and I always want to support other people. So those are my three realities that I really tell myself almost every single day, if not more than one time a day, about who I am and about what my life is. So if anybody has anything they want to share, please feel free to even mention one of them if you're comfortable or all of your realities as to what makes you either a good person, a happy person, anything you can share that makes you feel good. I think Renee's hand is up from the last time. I can't tell though. Renee's hand up from the last time. Gabby, how about you? Did you just raise yours? Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, 
I, one of the things that helps me is just to remember who I am. And I do have some things written on my whiteboard or in various journals and things so I can see them because as I go through life and maybe you guys are the same way, I feel like I'm in a constant state of just forgetfulness. Like, okay, like where was I? What was I focused on? What were my goals? And even though I have them all written down, it's really easy to fall out of the mindset. And one of the things that I, that helps me is to frame it like um, a choice. Like I choose to live my true nature and purpose. And that's very macro for me. And that helps me when I feel like I'm bogged down in details that feel like I don't want to be doing these details. Um, but just knowing that I'm moving closer to, you know, being creative and having the things I want to have and just moving towards that is means all the world. And also another one that I like is um, um, I choose to be the predominant creative force in my life, which kind of shifts it for me feeling like a victim. Um, and so those are the two things that I find the most helpful when my mind's kind of in a rut. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah, that's amazing. And I know you can get mantras anywhere. You know, you can Google them or, you know, buy a little pretty journal that already has them written in there. But I really want you once we get off this call tomorrow over the weekend, whenever, to really write down three realities that could become your mantras to give you a positive, uplifting, anything, you know, like I said, that it just doesn't have to be read whenever you're feeling down or something bad has happened. You should also read these realities and think about them when your day is going good too. Thank you guys for sharing. That means a lot to me. So we're going to do a little recap here about what we uncovered and what you hopefully learned today. We discussed what is and what is an imposter syndrome. And I think everybody had a pretty good idea before coming on this call what it was, but I hope that you got some new information and, and gleaned some new items. Um, we talked about the three early experiences, which I really suggest that you maybe Google or look them up. Um, I need to have a resource slide on here so that I can give you easy resources to find to really dig in and read a little bit more about those early experiences. Um, same with the imposter personalities, right? You want to know which one of those you resonate with. And there's also solutions for those too. You know, there's positive thinking that you can take that'll help you turn around the negativity of some of those imposter personalities. My WTF tips, if anything, please remember WTF. And then your three realities. I think it's really important that you have those three realities. And you know what? You might have five. You might have 10 for all that I know. Um, but just for sake of time and not to put too much pressure on people, I just did it as a three. I love odd numbers. Um, so yeah, let's continue the conversation. There are two ways that you can stay in touch with me and work with me. You can get the 21 book at 21book.com and it's T-W-E-N-T-Y. W-O-N book.com. It's also available on Amazon. And if you have a group or organization that needs a speaker, and if you enjoyed my presentation today, I would love to connect with you afterwards and talk to you. I talk to entrepreneurs, sales teams, women's groups, networking groups, business organizations, chamberers, the whole nine yards. So anybody who needs any kind of support, speaker, anything like that, I would love to give my presentation to you as well. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to speak up. And um, thank you all so much for attending this evening. Merrily, thank you for inviting me to do this for your group. And um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Go give ourselves a round of applause. You guys did awesome. I'm very proud of all of you for participating and for giving information. So, Cora, did you have a question? I think that was clapping. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Renee was clapping too. I can hear her. Ladies, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.